Our scripture today is from 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 18 through 26. Then King David went in and sat before the Lord, and he said, Who am I, sovereign Lord, and what is my family, that you have brought me this far? And as if this were not enough in your sight, sovereign Lord, you have also spoken about the future of the house of your servant, and this decree, sovereign Lord, is for a mere human. What more can David say to you, for you know your servant, sovereign Lord, for the sake of your word and according to your will, you have done this great thing and made it known to your servant. How great you are, sovereign Lord. There is no one like you, and there is no God but you, and we have heard with our own ears. And who is like your people, Israel, the one nation on earth that God went out to redeem as a people for himself and to make a name for himself and to perform great and awesome wonders by driving out nations and their gods from before your people whom you redeemed from Egypt. You have established your people Israel as your very own forever, and you, Lord, have become their God. And now, Lord God, keep forever the promise you have made concerning your servant and his house. Do as you promised so that your name will be great forever. Then people will say, the Lord Almighty is God over Israel, and the house of your servant David will be established in your sight. Thanks be to God. I want to say hello to everyone who is with us in this room, in this spiritual house, or if you're joining us um, online as well. Um, It's so good to join with you today in celebration of God's faithfulness, his faithfulness to this church. For the last few years, we've been in, um, uh, looking towards the future, in a, a season of sort of vision casting and asking, what, what does God have next for us? And then building a physical campus to help us run after that vision together. And there's been a lot of construction, a lot of disruption. It has not been easy. I am so glad to be on the other side of this. I don't know if you remember when we had like dueling giant cranes that had to be tall enough to swivel above the steeple of our church, um, I actually tried to climb up into one of the cranes like to give a sermon on the top of the crane. I thought that would be kind of cool, but the insurance company said that they wouldn't underwrite that. Um, You may remember there was a stretch of construction where literally the only room that we had available in the entire church was this sanctuary. And then we found out we had to put sprinklers in this room, and so we had to shut it down as well. But as hard as it was... In the, and all of you are looking up like, where are the sprinklers? I don't see the sprinklers. Go for it. It's going to be a long sermon, a long sermon. But as hard as it was, in the midst of this really disruptive project, and even over the last year with COVID and having to close our doors, it's interesting how much we've learned and how much we've grown, like as a family, along the way. Uh, We have welcomed over 600 new members into our church family since construction began. Our overall reach and engagement like in worship and community groups and baptisms and generosity have all gone up. Our mission in Dallas, mercy extending to the most vulnerable, our impact on this city that we love has been strengthened in this season. Now there are certainly things like global mission trips that have been harder because nobody's able to travel. But we've even learned new ways to help connect people's hearts to what God is doing in the majority world. Like 260 plus families saying yes to sponsoring and being in this long-term friendship with a child in Kenya. Or the virtual Iran mission trip experience yesterday, linking people um, to the amazing work that God is doing through the Iranian church. So since we began this Transform project, um, we've also reached out into this city by planning two new congregations as part of this one family of churches. Uh, Peak Street Church, which is reaching a new generation of college grads and hipsters in Old East Dallas, and, um, and now Grace Lake Highlands, which amazingly was able to launch right in, in, the, in the square middle of the pandemic. And this is, it became a mission-first community. They couldn't gather for worship, so they just started serving. And now they have so much momentum with Charlie Dunn uh, leading there. Uh, There were some people who said along the way, why would you start new churches, two new churches in other parts of the city at the same time that you're trying to strengthen this base here on University Boulevard? Isn't that going to distract people or siphon off energy or creativity or leadership or resource? 
To which I would say, if we weren't launching new churches and sending out new leaders beyond these walls, then maybe we shouldn't be doing this in the first place. It was never just about what can happen in a room like this. It's about helping people find and follow Jesus beyond these walls so that our city and the entire world can flourish because of the work Jesus does in their lives. I have a good friend who says God doesn't use us to get projects like this done. He uses projects like this to get us done, to mature us, to grow faith in us, to build character and resilience. And see, the real transformation is not the bricks and the mortars and the buildings. It's what God is building in you and in me. And there have been few things in my life that have helped get me done more than this transform journey. The ways that God has shown up in and through this project, it has humbled me and challenged me and forced me to grow new leadership muscles. It has forced me to my knees in prayer and given me even more faith for what God has in the future for this church. This mission that is 95 years, 95 years in the making. I was talking with a guy named Woody Strodel last week. And if you've been around here for a while, you know Woody Strodel was a beloved pastor in this church for decades. And he has so many stories uh, of God's faithfulness and lives that have been changed here. He also reminded me that when the original Hunt Building was opened back in 1980, some of you were here for this, Woody Strodel got to uh, shoot the first basketball shot in the, what was in the new gym on the third floor. He got dibs on the first shot. I asked Woody if he made the shot. He said, of course I did. And then I got to tell him that, hey, I got to take the first shot in the new gym now on the east side of the campus. And it was so much fun. If you haven't seen this gym, it's incredible. Um, then Woody asked me if I made my shot. I told him that's between me and God. <laughs> and it was an air ball. But to be grafted into this 95-year-old story, Allie and I have been here. Um, we've been here almost seven years now. It's crazy even saying that. The time has just flown. And we are so thankful God called us here. We're grateful that you have given us and continue to give us the chance to serve alongside you. We feel like we have been grafted into this legacy and this rootedness. And it is a gift that I can't fully explain. Earlier this week we had a time as our uh, staff came together to pray. And we were encouraged just to take time to give thanks, to practice gratitude, to praise God, to say, God, thank you for being such a good God. Thank you for all of these gifts. And as we were praying, I just, I kept thinking back and kept um, all of these moments in my life that have been tied into what God is doing in this church. I thank God that I get to be a part of a church that is for the city, not against, not separate, not cloistered away, but we exist for the flourishing of the city where God has planted us. We believe that Dallas should actually look a little bit more like heaven because this church exists in Dallas just as it is in heaven. That's our prayer. I thank God for the pioneering spirit of those who have gone beyond this place into the world in mission and outreach and into different cultures. I don't know if I've ever been part of or, or, or heard of a church with such a legacy of sending people out into all corners of the planet and not just talking about it, but folks who, who, who risk their comfort and safety and maybe they grew up here, but they said, God has placed this call on my life and they've gone to share the hope of Jesus. I was hanging out with Fred Nadavi recently. Fred used to be on staff here. Um, and it was a part of our All Nations community. Eventually, he felt called to go and launch a, a nonprofit called Inspire Spaces, which helps invest in the next generation in Kenya. And then to think that was only possible because for this church, it wasn't just, hey, let's have a global impact out there. It was let's seek to become a more globally connected church right here on University Boulevard through All Nations and now the Mandarin Church. I thank God for the ways this church doesn't retreat or cower away when hard things happen in this world. And in our culture, we wrestle, we lament, we listen, we pray, we go back to Scripture. God, how are you calling us now to live in these days where, where injustice and racism and division and rage and cancel culture are just shaking the core of our country? Jesus, how are you calling us to be salt and light, winsome in our witness, not hiding, not condemning, but redeeming culture and always bending toward love? Clayton Bell preached a sermon when they opened and dedicated the original Hunt Building. 
And I know I'm throwing out too much history today, but um, these are such great words. Here's what Clayton Bell said. Do we want Highland Park to be a great church? It will be as great as our willingness to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love others as ourselves, a, a love expressed in humility and service. And I thank God for that posture of humility, servant love toward the world when this church is at its best. I wonder how many people who are in this gathering today, how many of us in this spiritual room have something that we could add to that list that we are so grateful for. Some life-changing moment that happened by God's grace in this spiritual house. I did something like this a few years ago when we began this transformed journey and I thought it might be good for us to do again today. So I want to just run through these, uh, some of these. And, and as I do, I want you to think about your life, your heart, your family, your story. And I'll ask you to raise your hand if this is true for you. I thought about how many people have come to know Jesus here. Maybe as a kid or a student or confirmation or through Alpha, but you met Jesus for the first time in, in this church. Is that true for you? Or how many of us learned how to pray? And not just the Lord's Prayer, but the power of prayer, the healing and redemptive and reconciling power of prayer in this church. Is that true for you? Or how many of you feel like your eyes have been opened wide to what a global, multicultural, diverse family the church really is? And that's happened because of your involvement and engagement with this church. Is that true for you? Or how many families and parents who baptize a baby here and you saw the way that the children's ministry or the day school or the Hillier school kept pouring Jesus' love into the lives of your children and your family? Is that true for you? Or how many people here who suffered... Maybe a heartbreaking loss, but you found comfort and you found encouragement and healing in this place. Or how many people struggled with an addiction or someone in your family or, or, or someone you love or a friend, and they found freedom and healing here in this church. Is that true for you or someone in your life? How many people who've just been beat down by life and by COVID or maybe you've had bad decisions or regrets in your past and you have found grace and you've met the God of the second chance in this church. Is that true for you? So much to be grateful for. And in that text that Ashley uh, just read for us, here's David doing just that. He is pouring out his praise before God. Who am I, God? And, and, and what is my house that you have brought me this far? God, there is none like you and no God beside you. It's an amazing prayer. I'd encourage you to read through it later today. This entire chapter is King David, who's been through so much. He's spent more than a decade of his life on the run, being chased down by King Saul. He knows what it's like to have everything stripped away, living in a cave, cut off from friends and family. And now, finally, he has rest from his enemies. And so he says to God, you have been so good to me, God, and now I want to be good for you. I want to build you a house. You see, for all these years, the ark of the Lord, which represents the very presence of God dwelling among his people, the ark, and maybe you hear that word ark and you start to think Indiana Jones and creepy pagan rituals that happen underground in the tunnels, but the ark represented the fullness of the presence of God and goodness of God dwelling among the people. And David says, I want to build a house, a permanent place where God can rest and dwell and we can come to meet with him. And what God says back to David, I love this, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 11, the Lord declares to you, right? David wants to build a house. God says back to David, the Lord declares to you that the Lord is going to make you a house. So David, in his love and zeal, and desire to honor and bring glory to God says, I want to build you a house. And God says, David, I'm going to make you a house. It's this reversal. It involves a word play around this word house 15 times in this text. This word house in Hebrew is used. And it's like what began with David thinking about a physical house and bricks and mortar and a place to worship God, it becomes this image of the enduring house of God, a royal dynasty, a nation, a people with whom God would dwell. And see, from where we're sitting today, 3,000 years after David walked this earth, we know that the true 
and great fulfillment of this promise was Jesus himself, the son of God, a, a son from the line of David who came to make his home with us and in us. John chapter 1, the word became flesh and made his dwelling, his home, his house among us. Bob Munger was a longtime Presbyterian pastor in Berkeley, California, I think later in Seattle. And he once preached a sermon, and it became this amazing little book called My Heart, Christ Home. My Heart, Christ Home, sort of a classic. And he said, without question, one of the most profound Christian doctrines is that Jesus himself, when he enters a heart, he makes his home in us. Christ will make his home in the human heart. Uh, later in John's gospel, Jesus says to the disciples, anyone who loves me will obey me. My Father will love them, and we, we will come and make our home with them. And you have to understand, we read that from our perspective, and it makes sense, but the disciples were like, I don't get it. They were baffled by this. What, is, what are you talking about, Jesus? And then, and then, see, he goes to the cross, and then he's put into the tomb, and then he's raised from the dead three days later, and then after 40 days, he's ascended into heaven, and then Pentecost came. Pentecost. And the Holy Spirit was given to the church, and it's like now, now we see it. Now we get it. Now we understand. God wasn't dwelling in the temple in Jerusalem. He's not dwelling in any physical space or temple or sanctuary made by human hands, God's dwelling place is now the human heart. It's not a building he wants to fill. It's you and me. That's his home. Sometimes we talk about the moment when someone invited Jesus into their heart. You ever heard that before? When did you invite Jesus into your heart? I still can remember the exact day, location, time, the person that was with me, Tim Cornelson, my young life leader. And he said to me, Brian, you can invite Jesus into your heart. Just ask him to come in. And I did. And it wasn't like some real fireworks, spectacular, emotional kind of thing, but it was so real. And Jesus became the center of my life and everything changed. It's like he came into the darkness of this heart and flipped this switch, and the light came, and it changed everything. And friends, that's why we built this house, this Highland Park Church house, so that one more person and one more child and one more family might come and might hear, and they might invite Jesus to make their heart his home. And then one more, and then one more, and one more, and one more to make their heart his home. And see, part of this transform project, our hope was just to have a house that reflects and matches the warm and welcoming heart of this church family. You know, sometimes we can forget because we feel, I feel so loved and so at home here. But because of that, we can forget what it was like for the first time to walk into the doors of a church. I still remember my first time walking through those doors into this sanctuary. I was a college student, hadn't been a Christian for too long. I walked in and I, I just, I had never seen such a beautiful space. Wow. But as I walked in, I didn't, I didn't know where I was supposed to sit. Like, were there pews reserved for spiritual novices or new people? And like everybody knows, I didn't know what to wear. I didn't know when to sit down or when to stand. I didn't know the difference between a doxology and a Gloria Patri. I just kind of faked it and went along with whatever Jay Lee told me from up front to do because Jay has been here that long and he never ages. But I just went along with it. But it can be intimidating to enter into a church for the first time. And so we wanted this to be as inviting a place for, for, for families and kids and single people and senior adults and, and young adults as inviting as possible. Whether you've been a follower of Jesus your whole life or this is literally the first time you've ever stepped foot into a community where there are Christians. That you would walk in and you would have this experience that just communicates welcome home. We've been waiting for you. And not like in a creepy kind of way, but we're, we're so, we are just so thankful that you're here and you chose to be here and this place is for you. And we'd love for you to belong to this family. 
Maybe that's why we've gone with this phrase, welcome home, welcome home. Now, there's one more layer to this story, this interaction between David and God that I want to reflect on in his prayer. And then we're going to sing and we're going to share together in this moment, rededicating our lives and these spaces together. And here's the added layer to this story. And it's that sometimes God just says no. Sometimes God says no. Right after years of battle and years of strife, we're told that David finally, we read in chapter 7, that David has rest from his enemies. And you read that and you're just like, oh. And he, and he is able to reflect on God's goodness. And then he realizes, like, here I am living in luxury in this stone and cedar palace that was built by the Phoenicians, which must have been some ancient version of of restoration hardware. But he's got this beautiful house that he's in while the ark of the Lord is still in a temporary tent. And so David decides to build a temple, a house for the Lord. And God says to him, "I I didn't ask for a temple. I didn't give you that job. In a sense, God says no. As noble and good and right sounding as that must have been, sometimes God just says no. Why he says no, we're not given a clear answer in this text. Often we don't get to know why. Now there was a moment later in 1 Chronicles where David's looking back and reflecting. He says, this is the word of the Lord that came to me. You have shed much blood and have fought many wars. You are not to build a house for my name because you have shed much blood on the earth in my sight. It's like all the violence and the bloodshed that David has has had to lead his people through, maybe he wasn't the right guy to build this house for the Lord. But David has this dream, this longing, and God says no. And some of you know what it's like when it's like you bring a dream, a longing, a prayer, a hope to God, and he he seems to say no. And I don't want to dwell on this point too long, but that can happen in a person's life. And And it can also happen in a church's life. There was an era of real division in this church going back to the 60s, I believe, when like momentum, all this momentum stalled out. They were without a pastor for a long time. They weren't reaching new people. There was infighting going on. I can't imagine ever like a church struggling with infighting. But but the elders, they realized at one point they had to come together. And so the deacons and the elders, they gathered together, and you can actually read about this in our archives, like in the session meeting minutes of one of our elder meetings. And it says this, and it's so beautiful. Then all went to their knees in prayer, and the Holy Spirit manifested himself, Pentecost, in evident power. Confessions of wrong attitudes and wrong relationships were poured out to God and later to one another. There was the washing away of all pettiness and bitterness. And as never before, the group was fused into a spiritual unity. And that led to a time of revival and unprecedented growth and just kingdom vitality in this church. Renee Schlaffer um, talks about seeing these no moments like with David, when it seems like God says no, that to see it not as rejection, but as redirection. It's not rejection, it's redirection. It's like these moments when it can seem as if a door is slammed in your face, or a relationship is torn apart, or a church gets split down the middle. As painful and gut-wrenching an experience as that may be, even if it seems like the trial didn't come directly from God, he can still use it for his purposes. He can still bring good out of it. A little like what happened 30 years ago when half of this congregation went to go start a new church. Incredibly painful season. The stories I've heard of families like being split in half around the dinner table. Just this week I was having lunch with a friend and he was talking about how when he was a kid, like one week His Sunday school class was filled with all of his friends and the next Sunday all of his friends were gone. And he was like, as a child, he didn't understand why that would happen in a church. I remember Allie and I, when we first came here and we said to each other, wow, this is such an amazing Jesus-centered congregation. But we just get the sense that some people are still really hurting and wounded from this church split that took place a couple years ago. And then someone told us it wasn't a couple years ago. It's been 25 years. And that's 
That's how deep the wounds can run. And yet somehow God knows, God knows what he's doing in the pain of that no, in the pain of that split, and he can still use it for his purposes, and he will still bring good out of it. His no today can make the way for a better yes tomorrow. And I know for some people this is still just, it stings, and I get that, and I don't want to minimize that. But to think that now, now there are these two vibrant churches and spiritual homes where there used to be one. And out of these two churches have been, have been planted and launched more than 100 new churches, new communities, new beachheads for the kingdom here and here and here and here and all around the city of Dallas and around the world offering hope and grace and rescue and justice and good news for the poor and good news for the poor in spirit. So this is a celebration Sunday. And we're not just looking back in gratitude, although we need to do that because we know that God is not done. We're looking forward, just like David does in this prayer. He says, God, would your name be magnified and made great forever and ever through this spiritual home and this spiritual family. Would you always bless this house? And that's our prayer. God, would you make this into a house where marriages are healed and families are reunited, where people who lost hope can now find it in you, where prodigals come back home, where elder brothers who have these callous hearts, they're softened and made new and receiving the, the love of God and the love of the Father once again. Make this into a house where the next generation receives the blessing of the generation that has followed Jesus for so much longer than they have. May this be the house where unity across cultures and races and generations, it shines like a hill like a city on a hill. God, would you make this into a house where our commitment to love Jesus and to love others and to sacrifice and serve beyond these walls, it becomes such a reality in Dallas that poverty goes down and divorce rates go down and drug houses are being shut down and more kids are safe to play on the streets and to go to school and to graduate and to flourish. May this be a house where people who are looking in from the outside and don't even believe in God, they begin to look and see what's happening in here and from out of these walls and they say, I might not even believe what they believe, but I am so grateful that church exists. May it please you, God, to bless this house. And so, Father, we thank you that, that you came and then you sent your son Jesus to make his home in us. And, and so would you do that again for us today? Whether it's just a reminder of what you can do or for the first time to say, Jesus, would you come and make your home in, in my heart? And as that happens, would, would this community become such an unstoppable force of, of welcoming so many people into a spiritual home and then not stopping there but just taking that out into the streets and neighborhoods and communities and families and around the world so they might know that we who have built our life on you, we have found this hope and it is for everyone. We pray this in Jesus' name and everybody said, amen.